Today's scripture is Exodus chapter 18. Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard, all, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel his people, how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, had taken Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her home, along with her two sons. The name of the one was Gershom, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. And the name of the other, Eliezer, for he said, The God of my father was my help, and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness, where he was encamped at the mountain of God. And when he sent word to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and bowed down and kissed him, and they asked each other of their welfare and went into the tent. Then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for, the, for Israel's sake, all the hardships that had come upon them in the way and how the Lord had delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel, in that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord, who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God, and Aaron came with the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. The next day Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone, and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people came to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another, and I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice, I will give you advice, and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God, and you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws, and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you. You will be able to endure, and all this people also will go to their place in peace. So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And they judged the people at all times. Any hard cases they brought to Moses, but any small matter they decided themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went away to his own country. You may be seated. Father, as we turn to your word right now, Lord, would you um, help us to see all that you would show us, to hear all that you would say to us, and that we might live lives that um, um, honor you and um, show you to the world around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Uh, amen. Today, in our last week, we're still in the wilderness, and, um, and we have the story of Moses and his father-in-law, uh, Jethro. And, uh, and the first thing to say about this story that is that it's often used out of context uh, in leadership conferences, Christian podcasts, uh, to give leaders tips and tricks on how to be more effective. Titles like Delegation Strategies for Effective Leaders. Leadership structures to maximize your influence, my favorite. How to get fired up without getting burnt out. Um, <laughs> that's the title of today's so No, it's not. Um, all, all of that's good stuff, right? And, it, and it's in there and there's space for that. But if we're not careful, this, this can be reduced to a bit of a TED talk and not a sermon. Uh, and because what I want to suggest today is that the author of Exodus is trying to show us um, more than simply a strategy for effective leadership. What I want us to see is that while there are some practical tips, and, and please do take the practical tips, 
uh, for leadership, um, I think it's saying more about God's plans and purposes than about your personal development. Saying more about God's plans and purposes than about our personal development. And so to help us navigate the text today, uh, there's two points, because really the story is told in two parts. Uh, Two points are, first, the start of the mission, and second, the limits of the man. The start of the mission and the limits of the man. So first point today, the start of the mission. In the first half of our text, you'll have noticed, uh, we have what we might call the conversion of Jethro. The conversion of Jethro. Now, people will argue whether or not this was a real, true conversion in the sense that has Jethro really been grafted into the people of God. But I think the text seems to imply that this man, who is a priest of Midian, so he's an outsider, he's not an Israelite, not a, not a follower of Yahweh, he hears about Yahweh and ends up worshipping Yahweh. In verse 1, we, we read that he hears indirectly about the good work that God had done among the people of Israel. And then secondly, he hears directly from Moses, where we read in verse 8, then Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake. All the hardship that had come upon them in the way and how the Lord had delivered them. So indirectly on the grapevine and directly through Moses, Jethro hears the news. And then it says, and I think this is where we get real evidence of true conversion, true transformation. It says in verse 9, And Jethro rejoiced for all the good that the Lord had done to Israel in that he had delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord, who has delivered you out of the hands of the Egyptians and out of the hands of Pharaoh, and has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods, because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and sacrifices to God, and Aaron came with all the elders in Israel to eat bread with Moses' Moses' father-in-law before God. And so Jethro doesn't merely hear about God. He, He responds by rejoicing. He responds in worship. He responds by proclaiming the supremacy of the name of Yahweh. And he even responds by making sacrifices and eating a meal, which might be understood as a covenant meal, uh, with the elders of Israel, which sounds like a pretty thorough conversion to me. His life is transformed. And on the surface, this is a simple and yet beautiful story of a family member father-in-law who hears about the mighty works of God in his relative's life and comes to know God for himself. That's what we have here. It's great. And Christ said, I think, I think this should, at one time, give us great hope. Give us great hope for those family members, the father-in-law, the mother-in-law, the cousins, the siblings, the parents, the children who don't yet know God, who seem far off from God, but who God has a plan for. It should give us great hope, but it should also give us great confidence as we share our faith with them, remembering that no one, Christ City, no one is beyond the reach of God. I was teaching our Essentials class. We have a class called Essentials here Uh, where we teach the foundational Christian uh, doctrines. And uh, a young lady in the class, uh, she she came uh, and she said she came to the class in order to learn theology so that she might be equipped to share her faith with her colleagues because she has conversations with her colleagues and doesn't feel like she has uh, the the right knowledge to be able to share that with um, them, which is such a great reason to come to the class. Um, And she asked me in in the Q&A about strategies for sharing her faith um, with others, with her colleagues. And, um, and my answer to her wasn't dissimilar to this passage. You see, if we were to ask, what does Moses do to bring Jethro to faith? It says this, that he simply told Jethro all that the Lord had done. He told Jethro all that the Lord had done. He shared what we might call his testimony. His testimony. 
You know, sometimes we can get caught up, can't we, on knowing all of the right answers here, saying the right thing. Even if you've been a Christian for a long time, sometimes in your own conversation with your colleague or your family member and you feel like you're starting to drown, I don't know enough. I need to know more. I need to go to Regent. No, it's, hear me right. It's not a bad thing to study theology. It's not a bad thing to go to Regent. It's not a bad thing. We, we, in fact, we encourage that here. We encourage that with our classes, and uh, we want to learn good theology. And, uh, but you know, there's, there's one thing that you already have. There's one thing that you already have that doesn't require a philosophy degree or a theology degree, and that is your testimony. You have that. If you're a Christian here today, you have a testimony, your story, what the Lord has done in your life. Moses, it says, simply told Jethro what God had done, how there was enslavement and then there was salvation, how there was need and then there was provision, how there was danger and then there was protection. He simply communicated all that the Lord was doing in the people of Israel, and that was enough. That was enough. Christ I hope you know this, but if you're a Christian here today, you have a testimony. You have a testimony, and therefore you have all that you need to share your faith with your colleagues, with your family members. You have all you need to speak to people about God because you simply need to tell people all that he has done in your life. So on the surface, this is a simple and yet hopefully encouraging story of conversion, of someone coming to faith through the simple testimony of a family member. But as good as that is for us to hear, I actually think there's, there's more going on in this story than, than that. Let me explain what I mean. Um, one of the questions that is often asked of the Bible is, why did God choose Israel and not any other nation? Well, why did God choose Israel and not any other nation? In fact, this challenge to what we might call the election of Israel um, is even more pronounced, isn't it, when we face stories like last week. Remember last week when God fights for Israel and not the Amalekites? And if you're new to the Bible, you might come to that and say, it's a bit unfair, isn't it? It seems exclusive, doesn't it? And therefore, excluding. But often, this challenge comes from what I believe is a misunderstanding of God's purpose in election. You see, if you remember, right from the very beginning, right at the start of where, when God makes a covenant with Abraham, God explicitly states that the purpose of forming this people is to bless all people. The purpose of selecting, electing this people is to bless all people. See this in Genesis 12 where it says this, Now the Lord said to Abraham, as Abraham or Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. So that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And this idea of, of blessing the nations is famously summarized by God through the prophet Isaiah where God says to, of Israel that I will make you a light to the nations. I will make you a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Christ City, the purpose of God choosing a people for himself is not just for them, but through them, all people would be blessed. All nations. A missionary and scholar Leslie Newbegin, he puts it like this. They, that is Israel, are chosen not for themselves not to be the exclusive beneficiaries of God's saving work, but to be the bearers of his saving work, his, of the secret of his saving work for the sake of all. 
They are chosen to go and bear fruit. And so God's particular election of Israel, while exclusive at the start, has an inclusive trajectory. Meaning that while it begins with Israel, it doesn't end with them. And Christ said, it's important that we know this because the mission that God began with Abraham and now is taking shape with Moses finds its fullness in Jesus and its fulfillment in the church. That, that's why Jesus, when he gives the Great Commission, you know, Matthew 28, the Great Commission, what does he say? Make disciples of all nations. That's the trajectory of the mission that it's going out into all the world, for all people. This is the mission of God, to draw people to himself from every tribe and every tongue. And in this story of Jethro, think about it, where we are in the narrative, in this story of Jethro, this Midianite priest, significant, he's an outsider. We have one of the first recipients of this mission. One of the first recipients of this covenant blessing. He's drawn into the family of God and therefore receives all of the blessings of Israel. That, that's what we have here. But there's something else I want us to see. Um, because it's not obvious in the English, and so we might not pick up at it at first, but apparently it's clear in the Hebrew. My Hebrew is rough. Um, um, but there's one thing that the author wants us to see in this story because the placement of this text, and often people think, why, what's this story about and why, is it, why does it fit here? The placement of this text is very significant. It's significant that chapter 18 comes after chapter 17. It's significant that Jethro the Midianite comes after Amalek. If you remember last week the Sam preached in chapter 17, what happened? Amalek and the Amalekites, it says they came out and they fought Israel. And now, in chapter 18, we have Jethro, this Midianite, this, also an outsider from another nation. It says he came out and he welcomed Israel. Here's what we're supposed to see. What we're supposed to see then is while that this, this mission of God is expanding into all nations, that other nations are coming into contact with, the, the, uh, with Yahweh and his people, there are two opposing responses to God. There is chapter 17 and there is chapter 18. There is the Amalekites and there is the Midianites. There is war and there is worship. And that's what we're supposed to see. Here's the point. The point here is not that God hated Amalek and the Amalekites and he loved the Midianites as if, as if the favor of God falls down ethnic or social or political lines. No, the point here is that the dividing line in humanity is and always has been whether or not we accept or reject God. And so the question implicit in this text as we read through the narrative, through Amalek, through Jethro and the Midianites, is not, are we an Amalekite or are we a Midianite? No, it's will we respond to God like Amalek or will we respond to God like Jethro? Do we hear of God's power and his love? Do we hear about the testimony of his goodness and his faithfulness? And do we rage against it? Or do we, like Jethro, respond in worship? Christ City, this and what we have in this text is the start of the mission. The expansion of God's blessing into the world through this people. To go out to all nations, to all people, including you, if you are here and you don't yet know. But the question for you is not, are you of the right tribe? <laughs> The right people group? Do you have the right background? Have you done the right things? Are you the right type of person? No, the question is simply this. Will you accept God or will you reject him? Will you war against him or will you bow down and worship him? 
That is and always has been the dividing line in humanity. Point one today, the start of the mission. Point two, the limits of the man. Verse 13 says, The next day Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me and inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another, and I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. So Moses, as, as God's chosen leader, he's adjudicating between the people and making known to them uh, how they should live according to the law of God. But there's a problem, isn't there? And the problem is that Moses is just one man. Faced with leading a multitude of people, thousands of people. Moses is, with the best of intentions, I'm sure, working all day, every day, and he's on the verge of what today we might call burnout. He's on the verge of burnout, which sadly, I'm sure many of us are familiar with. Um, he's suffering, actually, from one of the most common causes of burnout among Christians is because uh, he's not just doing good work, he's doing God's work. He's doing God's work. It's very important. And when we do God's work, we're not only prone to burnout, are we? We are um, almost justified in doing it. We've got lots of good reasons for the late nights and the long hours. Why? Because the mission is so important. Mission is so important. The need is so great. And guess what? We're so needed. Jethro sees through it, praise God, sees through it. And he says to Moses in verse 17, having Mo Moses just talked about how important his job is, how, how much godly work he's doing, Moses' father-in-law father said to him, what you are doing is not good. What you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out for the thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Now, I can imagine if Moses is anything like me, his first reaction would have been defensive. Um, I'm Moses. Uh, Burning Bush, remember that? He picked me. Um, staff in my hand, remember that? <laughs> the, the miracles, I was, I was involved. Um, God chose me chose me to lead the people. I'm doing God's work. Jethro basically says, I know it's God's work, but guess what, Moses? You're not God. And we need to hear that sometimes, don't we? We need to hear that we are limited. That we are human. Sometimes we can get caught up, can't we, in doing spiritual things. We forget that we are human, that we're limited. You know, humility isn't about pretending that we are weaker than we are. It's about recognizing that we are not as strong as we think. We're not as strong as we think. It's about coming to terms with our own capacity. God-given capacity, by the way. And even though this can be frustrating to hear, let me give us two benefits that are shown in our text, I think, uh, benefits of acknowledging the limits that we have. First is this. When we acknowledge our limits, in our weakness, God strengthens us with others. God strengthens us with others. You know, this text, it doesn't just parallel the uh, chapter 17 in, in, the, in the two responses uh, to the mission. In fact, if you might have picked up on this already, if you remember last week, interestingly, uh, we also had in chapter 17 a demonstration of Moses' weakness. Do you remember the story? Moses is holding up his hands during the battle and his arms are getting heavy. We've all felt this when we've tried to pray for someone, right? Your arms getting a bit heavy. <laughs> Stop doing this. Or like you raise your hands in worship and it becomes like this. 
it's just me. Um, but, but there's a demonstration, isn't there, in chapter 17 of the weakness of Moses and what happens. His friends come and hold up his hands. And now again, Moses grows tired, and so Jethro steps in, and his advice is this. He says, now, obey my voice. I will give you advice, and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God, and you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they should walk and what they must do. So he's basically saying, keep doing what you're doing. In fact, the work that you're doing is good work. It's godly work. However, moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens. And let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you. You will be able to endure, and all this people also will go to their place in peace. Good advice. Thank you, Father-in-law. So just as Aaron and Hur supported Moses, held up his hands during the battle, now Moses is to find a group of capable and integrous men to support him in this work too. And so in both cases, we have the weakness of Moses, but we also have the support of friends. And it's a beautiful picture, I think, um, to us of how God supports us in our weakness by bringing people alongside us to carry the burden with us. Now, I'm sure you've experienced that. I have experienced that acutely. That God gives us tasks often too big for us as a way of showing us that we're not supposed to do them alone. In Christ City, I think that should be an encouragement to us as we think about our community and all that God is calling us to do together. I don't know how you think about church. But, but God often gives people tasks to do, things to do in his kingdom that are too big for them so that they draw others into the mission. I don't think it's just an encouragement. I also think this is a challenge to us. It's a challenge to us as a church. I think this is a challenge for those of us who think too highly of ourselves, of our own abilities and our own contributions. Uh, those of us who try to do everything on our own, not realizing uh, that you need others. But I also think it's a challenge to those of us who think too little of ourselves. And my guess is there's just as many people in this room who think too little of themselves, who think too much of themselves. Those of us that wait in the wings, who think they've got nothing to contribute, not realizing that others need you. You know, there's a pride that says, I must do everything. I must do everything. But there's also a pride that says, I can't do anything. And it's humility, isn't it, that says, I can't do everything, but I can do something. And that's, I think, the posture that we should all come into the church community with. You know, there's two ways, isn't there? There's two ways to conceive of a church. And we know this well, and we know this when we articulate it, but sometimes we, we fall into a pattern of, of the unbiblical view. There are two ways uh, that we can conceive of being part of the church, and only one of them is biblical. The first unbiblical view says that, that ministry is for a select few professionals and gifted people. It's for that guy. It's for those people. That's an unbiblical view. The biblical view recognizes that ministry is for everyone. You know, my job, and Sam's job, and Kendra's job, uh, is not to be the only ministers. Do you know that? But our job, it says in Ephesians, is to equip the saints for ministry. That's you. So our job is to equip you to be ministers. And so how many ministers do we have in this room? There's how many people? I'm not going to embarrass this person, but um, I'll tell you the story. I recently experienced this with someone in our congregation. 
Um, I had a lot going on. I was very busy. I felt a bit overwhelmed. I had various things that I was trying to juggle, and um, someone offered to take something off of my plate. They said, you know what? I'll just take this. And, um, and I wrestled with, with my pride because I, I like doing things the way I like doing them. And uh, I want to lead it the way I want to lead it. And uh, I also wrestled with the guilt. This, this happens sometimes because, you know, guess what? I get paid to do my job. And then this person was a volunteer. And they said, no, let, let me take it. Um, and it was too much for me. And so in the end, it was my limitation that, that forced me really to, to pass it on. Let me just say this. He did it way better than I ever could. And he seemed to enjoy it more than I ever would. <laughs> and... Uh, I thought, that, that's what it means. Hear me rightly here. This is not me saying I'm, I'm delegating my job to you. Although, it's biblical. No. <laughs> um, no, this is me saying that if all church is, is just to show up and have coffee on a Sunday and be ministered to, then I think we have minimized, I think we've reduced what it means to be part of a church community. Now, I think there's only a few people in this room that need to hear that because let me just say, this church community is very involved. Very involved. I see the ministry of the saints every day in the lives of you. And it's so encouraging. But let's, let me just encourage you in that. Christ City, we are God's people living by his word with his spirit for his mission to renew all things. It's a big mission. It's a big mission. Sometimes it can feel overwhelming, but guess what? He calls us to do it not alone, but together. So first, in our weakness, God strengthens us with others. But second thing I want to point out is that in our weakness, God shows himself to be strong. God shows himself to be strong. Uh, one of the things that this chapter does, as I've said, is it connects with chapter 17. There's a, there's a contrast that is being shown, a parallel that is being given. But the other thing that it does is it anticipates where we're going to get to in the following chapters in September, where God officially gives the law to Moses. But we can already see in this text, can't we, that, that, that Moses is, um, is administering the law, the statutes of God. Uh, for context, for those of you that don't know, the law of God is, is not just a set of arbitrary rules that God gives his people, but God gives the law as a way of forming this community to live in relationship with God and each other in such a way so as to demonstrate the character of God to the world. That, that's why the law is given. To, to shape a community so that they might demonstrate his love and compassion, his justice and his mercy um, among themselves and also um, to others. In fact, this is a foundational strategy for the mission of God in the world, that God's people will be set apart from the other nations because they're going to live according to this law so that his light might shine through them to the world. That's the logic of the law. That's what we're going to get to in September. But what we see here in our text today is that there is a deeper problem in Israel than simply the weakness of its leader. There is a deeper problem. You see, this text not only points us to the limitations of a man, it points us to the limitations of humanity. Points us to the limitations of humanity. Exodus scholar Peter Enns puts it like this. He says, the problem exposed here is not simply Moses' frailty, but the people's. Think about it. If they didn't have so many disputes, Moses wouldn't be so burnt out. He wouldn't be so busy if they just all got along. The process of making known to them the statutes and laws of God would have been a lot easier if they'd have just simply been righteous, if they'd have simply just lived in harmony with one another. The reason he's burnt out is not just because he's limited. The reason he's burnt out is because the people are sinful. They're broken. And so we can imagine, can't we, that even after Moses enlists help, he gets a band of brothers who are going to help adjudicate the law. There's still disputes. There's still fighting. There's still conflict. And we know this because logically, more judges doesn't mean less cases, does it? And what we're going to see, and we'll get there in September, so just put a pin in this one. 
I'm sure you'll remember, is that even after the law is written down and made clear, even after the Ten Commandments are given, it seems not to get better, but to get worse. And so here's the problem. The problem is this, that there is no leadership structure or governance manual a policy document or strategy or methodology that can overcome the heart of the human problem, which is the problem of the human heart. No matter how many judges there were in Israel, sin would abound. No matter how clear the laws were given, the law would still be broken. Because the problem for Moses and Israel and for us is not that the rules aren't good enough or that there's not enough people to administer the rules. It's that we're not good enough. The problem was always in here. In Christ City, that's been the point all the way through Exodus. That's what we've been seeing as we've been journeying through this story together, that our limitations can't be overcome by our efforts, but that God in his mercy uses our limitations to display his unlimited power. Jethro's advice was good. It was good. It was wise and it was welcome, but no amount of human wisdom or effort or strategy was going to stop sinners sinning. No amount of judges was going to stop the law being broken. And that's why we see the good news of the gospel already permeating our text today. It's the reason we see the gospel already being threaded through the story of Exodus. Because the God who frees slaves and splits seas and rains bread and fights battles is also the God who would ultimately save sinners by dying for sinners so that the law of God would be written not on tablets of stone, but on the hearts of men. Christ City, it's our limitations that draw us to his power. It's at the end of ourselves that we begin to see God. It's in our poverty that we are drawn to his uh, his riches. It's in our weakness that we start to long for his strength, so that we might not boast in our wisdom or our efforts or our strategies, but we might boast in the Lord. Amen. Amen. If you're able, would you stand as we respond?